Korea. We are live right now with a very special guest with us, Annie Cohen. She is an test in instrumentation engineer from Firefly Aerospace. So welcome, Annie, and thank you for accepting our invitation. We are honored to have you on board. Hi. So can you please introduce yourself? Hi. So can you please introduce yourself to our audience who are watching us right now? Hi, my name is made a name Annie Vo. Uh, I just got married, so my last name is now Annie Cohen. Uh, I am a test engineer that just switched into test instrumentation engineer at Firefly Aerospace. I've been working here for three years, officially last Friday. Um, before that, I was an intern at a, the another company, Firefly Space Systems. So we shut down, then we came back uh, with a new brand and new ideas and everything. So I've been working on some fun engines and we're a small rocket to launch into outer space and I am very excited to be here today. Yeah, nice. So we are also excited to have you here and we have um, we are sure that we will be getting a lot of audience who are interested to uh, know more about your journey and uh, we live in a country where every uh, you know kid aspire to be a space pioneer yes. and they want to know more about that how can they be uh, become one of the any Cohen or any Vo in our uh, from India? So, uh, like the one of the most common question that I ask to each and every panelist is, uh, you know, have you got into space industry? Like, what made you to enter into this domain? It's a little bit of a long story, so this might get a little winded. Um, when I was a little girl, my parents are immigrants, so they came from Vietnam before I was born in the eighties, and um, with that, my family all came over, like my aunts and uncles and everything. So one of my aunts actually works at NASA. She's a chemical, uh, chem a chemist at NASA, and her husband's also a rocket propulsion engineer. So Whoa. when I was little, they lived in Alabama, and I lived in Massachusetts, and my dad would always talk highly of his sister, saying like she's doing wonderful things. So I was always, always inspired to be like, I want to work at NASA. I want to try to do some of these things, but I never felt like I was close enough and of course early days we didn't have internet as much before so it was hard to keep in touch with her to understand what was going on so in in lieu of that my dad and my mom would always buy me space stuff so i have a little handheld uh telescope that my parents bought me and they'd always try and call my aunt and uncle and try to have them talk to me about space stuff so from an early age i was just intrigued with space it's like there's something out there that we don't we can't we don't know yet or we know very little about yeah. so as a little girl they just bought me everything that i could ever want in the store and just sparked my interest in it and as i grew up i was good at math <laughs> so oh <laughs> i was very okay. good at math so i was like okay i can try this and i just kept trying and i tried astronomy first in college and then to me, it was not a hands-on as much as I wanted it to be. So then one day I saw my uncle, my NASA aunt and uncle, and they gave me some advice and they said, try engineering. So I said, okay, I'll try a couple of classes. So this was already in college. So I started at community college and I tried uh, engineering physics and I did really well in it. So then I was like, okay. And then I was trying to figure out, well, what type of engineering do I want to do? There's a lot to pick from. So <laughs> I started thinking and I said, well, I like astronomy, so I like space, hands down. Yeah. But then I thought, how can I get there? There's mechanical, there's electrical, there's computers, like all of them play some sort of part in the space Ooh. industry as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I looked at the classes and the aero classes at UT, University of Texas at Austin, fully intrigued me, captured mm. me. So I applied and I got in. <laughs> so I got into aerospace engineering and I just kept going and I chose the space track. So I did more uh, guidance, navigation and controls. I did spacecraft dynamics. I love those classes. But then Whoa. when I graduated college, I was trying to find a job like all of us. Um, and then I, um, <laughs> so then I applied to Firefly Aerospace and they, they're local, so they're about 20 miles north of where I went to college and my family is all local too. So relatively very close to me. And so I just started my journey and it all started because my parents bought me a telescope when I was a little girl. Yeah. So, so, so you are one of those few kids who found the passion at very young age and is pursuing their dream of touching space, right? 
and yes. as you said that you were good at math and even i so i found out my passion at a very early i was not at all good at math and physics i completely messed up with my academics so i cannot now compare my life story with you <laughs> but yeah i surely want to build something that can touch space in future so yeah uh, it was really interesting to know your story and now uh, let's take the another question that is so how how did you actually got associated with firefly so like did you have any initial contact there or it was just like you uh you applied there and you had few interviews and then so what was the complete you know process of getting placed into the firefly uh, aerospace because aeros uh, firefly aerospace before was firefly space systems they were um another startup uh they were in 20 miles north of ut austin my university so they had a lot of initial contact with my school but i okay i didn't know what i was trying to really go for yet at the time but i just paid attention to who they were Uh, I did apply as an intern during college. I didn't get that, and then later on, after I graduated, one of my classmates at the time went to uh, started a job at Firefly Space Systems, and then during the, and I graduated in December 2015. So I took some time off to do some nonprofit work. I taught some students, uh, okay. local students, under at underprivileged areas in Austin, and then during the summer, I said I'm ready to start my career. So I, uh, my former classmate emailed my university saying, "Hey, we're hiring a firefly. Is anyone interested?" So then I emailed him back saying, "I'm very interested." And then we kind of mm. just chatted a little bit, and then uh, I had like three different interviews at the company, and then like three weeks later, I got the job. I was hired as a firefly, uh, an intern for test engineering, and then okay. We I worked for like two to three months, and then we started losing investors and shut down for a little bit, and then later on, I moped around, didn't have a job. I applied, <laughs> okay. and then um, Firefly Aerospace got bought out by a different investor, a sole investor, and then they started picking me back up. And then I started as designing, as as a design engineer, and then they were starting to build components, and they're like, "We need some test engineers again, Annie." You worked as a test engineer intern before. Do you want to go back? And I said, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's it's like an angel coming from uh, Silicon Valley and holding your hands, and now you're ready to fly, yes. right? Yes. Uh, so uh, so uh, so, did you have any experience of working on model rockets or high powered rockets uh, in your childhood or any? No, nope. this is my first experience. My first job. My first experience with testing okay. any working anywhere. Um, I had a small internship at NASA over um, the summer of 2015, um, but I did work on. I was I had tested some sounding rockets on an air bearing, but it was very still very early okay. days of it. So then, I think that's why Firefly Aerospace captured me because they wanted test engineers, and I was like, well, I have a little bit of experience with that. <laughs> yeah. So, like, like in India, if you if you see, like, it's very difficult for any engineer to build rockets of such big scale and to launch them because we don't have any space policy. So we are limited up to building, you know, uh, high-powered rockets. So, uh, what are your views on the importance of high-powered rockets or model rocket in learning the basic principles of the rocket? Like at the students level, if if students want to learn them, so how they can they uh, it help them out to uh, in the future projects like at a bigger bigger scale? Um. When you learn the smaller concepts, it scales pretty well up. Like when you are testing something, you test like a small component first, and then you start building up yeah. to bigger components. So, one of my first projects was uh, I did structures testing first. So I did tanks first, and okay. basically it was one fluid. It was the same fluid. It was liquid nitrogen and then gaseous nitrogen. So you'd use mm-hmm. liquid liquid nitrogen to fill the tank, and then you use Uh, gaseous nitrogen to, nitrogen to press the tanks, so I learned a lot during the small systems. And then my boss came to me and said, "I want you to work on propulsion now." And I was like, "Of course, I want to work on propulsion. I'm an aerospace student. I want the engine." <laughs> so I moved up into propulsion, as I like to call it. And then at that point, I gained so many more fluids, but the concept was the same. You, okay, you have. I had liquid nit. I have. Do I use it? I use liquid oxygen. I use kerosene, and I use TTEB, and I use nitri- uh, gaseous nitrogen. So I quadrupled okay. my fluids. 
Um, so learning from the small concepts and the small bases always scales up in, in a way that does help you later on. So, so long as you get your good foundation, you can always build up. There's always, always focus on having a great foundation before you can actually build something on top of that. True, true, true. So, yeah. So we have a question from one of the audiences, like Je named Jenny. She is asking that how is your first experience in NASA and what uh, and what so first thing that came in your mind while you know you got selected for the same. My first experience at NASA was phenomenal. It was kind of like a dream come true because as a little girl you always saw NASA. Uh, you see yeah. you know early early days NASA developing rockets, getting to the moon, go, going all the way through space shuttle, ISS, Hubble. Like all these things, so it was like it was phenomenal to see where we all came from. And then I, when I was in the labs, I could see some of like the '60s like projects and everything. And I'm like, this is still here. Yeah. This is still so cool. And I can touch it. I get to play with it. <laughs> so I took a lot of pictures, but I can't share all those pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Confidential, I think. Yes. Yeah. So NASA uh, so was really cool. Uh, it is, it is actually. So all of the space agencies, they are actually pretty cool. Like they are doing stuff for the space and I, and and for any space enthusiast, all the space stuffs are really cool. So yeah, uh, like you, uh, so Firefly Aerospace is, Aerospace is working basically on the small satellite market and small and medium launches, I guess, right? So what are your views? Like what are, uh, so can you share some insights about the market of the small satellites for the next 10 years? Like how fast it is going to scale up? Um. I'm not as familiar with some of those, the marketing side of things. I really focus on testing. I was okay. pretty heavily involved with testing. I um, I do know some of the stuff. I am not 100% as familiar as the business side of people of our company. They keep me pretty busy with testing. <laughs> yeah, so we saw one of the teasers of the, uh, launched by, released by the Firefly uh, aerospace and I guess you were there in that teaser. You were sitting in a mission control room uh, and near the even yeah. the uh, rocket engine. You, uh, yeah. So it 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 seemed like uh, it was a Marvel movie teaser going on because the music was very much dramatic and the scene was so like intense because you were going to test your rocket engines, right? Yeah. So yet Star also is aiming to you know be yeah. a part of such teaser in the future, like when we will be making our own engines and we'll so you know this is seriously very much inspiring for us as well yeah uh, yeah so being a, a test instrumentation engineer explain your feelings and uh, what goes in your mind you know just few seconds before the test or the or the you know 10 seconds of the countdown so what goes in your mind at that time are you nervous or you get excited about the test oh man that's a great question so i always <laughs> um I did some research a little bit ago where uh, your body responds to excitement and panic similarly. Yeah. So when I yeah. always get nervous, I try to turn it into excitement. So every yeah. time someone comes in to see me, they're like, are you nervous? I just say, I'm very excited about this test. Um, so that's so how that's you like can really nervous with excitement. Yeah. Oh, okay. So okay. One, of, one of my most nerve wracking moments has been, uh, we went from single engine testing to double. So we had two engines on the testing at the same time. And the moment we started to test, we started like filling the, the propellants into the system. I was okay. And then it was, I think when we started pressurizing the tanks, I started panicking. And my boss came up to me, he was like, are you okay? And I said, <laughs> I'm just very excited for this test. This is the first time we've ever got to do this. So he was like, you know, once you get this four is easy because ultimately our first stage is four engines. So we have done four engines. Uh, we did it uh, back in September. And so we have some really cool pictures from that one too, and some videos. It's actually really surprising that some, I think this is like my second time someone's noticed me in a video. The first time was <laughs> we got a new director in and he stopped me after the meeting. He's like, you were in the YouTube video. I'm like, no, I wasn't. <laughs> he was like, no, you were, you had the microphone and you were running the test. And I said, yes, I was. Uh, so I don't really notice that some people recognize me from those, but so leading up to the test, it's a little bit of a lot of initial nerves that hit me. And then as things start progressing, I'm just completely calm. It's okay. kind of weird. It goes from like a high intense nerves and it just comes down and it's like, okay, focus and calm. 
that. So, um, yeah, so the, when we do the countdown, it's always, then when we start counting down, it's always, it's like me counting down my nerves too, because one of, it's either myself as the test conductor or the test operator counts okay. down. And in either position, as a, we start counting down, my nerves start getting less and less. And it's just straight calm. And then as things are running, you kind of control your calm, your nerves because you have to remember that if something happens, you have to know how to react. Yeah. So I push all the nerves away and you just have to focus on the fact that you have an engine, you have a controlled combustion right here in front of you. And then what happens when something goes wrong? Yeah. And we've gotten better. We've, we've all had test hiccups before. Um, we've had some different experiences and it's, the last 10 seconds is like you have no control anymore. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it's in the auto sequence. It's in the hands of the engine and you just have to know how to react. Uh, yeah. cool. So, you know what, uh, actually, so we build high powered rockets and we launch them. So, uh, before, like before, before an hour of the launch, we actually get uh, nervous. So what we do is we stand in a, in a group and in a team. Then we perform the national anthem and then we have, we perform a war cry and it's so loud that the people nearby, yeah, they come to know that something is going to happen in this area and they need to evacuate that place anyhow. So that is, <laughs> that is what we act generally do. And if the same thing I, even I do is when someone asks me that, are you excited or nervous? I tell them I'm super excited for this because this is a moment yes. we are actually waiting for. And the last 10 seconds are like yep. 10 hours for us because we can feel each and every millisecond and microsecond of that. So yeah, it's oh, yeah. obviously being a rocket engineer, it's an amazing moment to have those 10 seconds in our life. So now another question is like, uh, so being a founder, uh, I am very much concerned. Obviously I'm concerned about the services and the products, but I'm more concerned about my company culture. I ensure that, uh, you know, each and every member stay happy and they should feel safe to work here. So I just want to know that what is the culture at, uh, you know, Firefly Airspace and how, uh, how you all maintain the culture there. So I saw in one of the videos, they said that we have a family type culture. So how you build that culture in your company? It's when you really think about it, you spend over 40, 50 hours with some of these coworkers, you kind of just develop these relationships with others. So. A bunch of them actually came to my wedding and I had a very, I have a very big family. So it was filled with family already. And then I just had like my fire five family there that filled up another three tables oh. and they're just very much supportive of you. Like you, you go into this day together, you go into these tests together, you set up these tests together. So you fight through these troubleshooting things, like something's not plugged in or there's a leak somewhere or all these daily struggles that you feel. And then you have these personal moments too like you know your parent gets sick or sick or something and your colleagues like hey go home take care of them I'll take care of this we're okay we're in good hands like we take care of each other here so I have uh I'm a lead of one person and she's like my little sister at this point like whatever she needs we have a moment like we have family time when something happens and there's some sort of reaction you just come in you're like hey I need five minutes to talk about personal life and you just listen to each other because you know, if you build that relationship, you build a stronger foundation to understand and help each other. So as you build these relationships you, from stuff outside of work, you build it inside of work and you understand each other and you know how each other works. And like, you know, this person responds well to this, this person likes to have food at, as treats. So if you help mm -hmm. feed them, they'll help do stuff for you. And then likewise, you kind of just build these relationships. So just over time, you just spend so much time with these people, you just become so close. So. With our anniversary last uh, last week, I texted some of my coworkers that started from the first day with us, with me. And it was just phenomenal to think about how far we've come as strangers to becoming family. Like uh, one of my colleagues, his uh, his family, his parents flew in. And so he uh, he texted me, he's like, can you stay for 20 minutes and talk to my parents? And I was like, of course. <laughs> so like I showed him the test and it was just phenomenal. Like, or when my, my mom comes to visit or something, all my colleagues that are very close to me, like my family members come in and say, hey mom, or like they, they greet my husband too. They like always hear about my husband and they, it just becomes like a family unit. So we become like a family, fire, a Firefly family. Yeah. So every time I email like a certain group of people, like, hey Firefly family, how's it going? How are we doing oh. today? So it just, the fact of the matter is that you work with them for 40 hours, but you care about them as humans too, because in order for us to do well as a company, 
we need to work with each other because it's never just one person. It's a whole team and multiple teams at it. Like we have the avionics team, we have structures team, we have machine shop team, we have composites team, we have propulsion team, we have test team. And mm -hmm. you have to have a good understanding with each other to work well with each other to grow and to build this company. True, 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 true. So yeah, so at Star, what we believe is like, uh, if you want to build a company, you need to focus on product or service. But if you want to build a legacy, then you need to focus on culture. And that is yeah. what we ought to aspire to have a very healthy culture, like yeah. Firefly. Yeah. yeah, so we- And it's absolutely true because like, even like my CEO, he comes in and he checks on me. He asks me every day, how's my cat? Or he comes okay. in, he asks me, how's my mom? How's my grandparents? How's my husband? He checks in on us. And like some of the other directors, they check in on me every now and then. They they genuinely care. And that's how I feel as an engineer to really grow. It's like, if someone cares about me, I'll work triple, quadruple, a thousand times better than what I can if someone just didn't care. So when you care about someone and you invest in your people, you could go very far. True. That's completely true. I agree with that. Like, uh, you know, there are a lot of, so it's very rare you find people who are not just focusing on numbers, but they're focusing on the team, their team members growth and they care for them. And it's oh, yeah. very nice to see and it's nice to hear that. So we have got a question from Sandeep. He's asking that, hello, uh, what are the technical challenges which are faced in the present era and the uh, RF communications segment during a launch from the ground to the orbit? Um. So the current challenges are mostly the government invest investments in space travel and space growth. Um, as a world citizen, I feel like we always want to take care of Mother Earth. So it's hard to sometimes invest in outside space. But mm. in my perspective, it's like if you take care of everything around you, everything grows together. So like we need satellites to monitor places that we can't see all the time. So small rocket companies could launch those rocket, those satellites up there and help take care of small things on Earth. So we're helping each other take care of Earth together. And as an Earth citizen, we have our solar system as well to take care of and our humanity. Yeah. Um, second part of the question was RF environments during launch. Yeah. Um, I am not 100% sure on that yet. I haven't had to launch yet, so I haven't been as involved with that so i'm very curious to fully understand it as well too so i'm sorry i can't answer your question very well <laughs> uh, so i would have answered it but even i failed in my sad com subject so i could not answer now <laughs> okay uh yeah so we have another question like uh, firefly is one of the companies selected for the nasa clps will firefly alpha or Fire firefly beta carry the lander to the moon this is very much fascinating question yeah even i want to know the answer let's see yeah Oh, goodness. I know Alpha, we can't get to the moon just yet. I think Beta, we are trying to get to the moon. But of course, we want to launch our Alpha later this year. Um, I think the success of Alpha will determine the success of Beta. I believe our mm. Beta will use some of the Alpha technology as well. So it kind of just very depends on this critical moment in time where we launch Alpha. I think ultimately, yes, Beta will help us get to the moon. But it all depends on Alpha right now. Yeah. The beta is the advanced version of it. And uh, so, so uh, if we talk in the terms of the percentage, then how, so what is the percentage of the technology, which is going to be, uh, you know, rem which will be remaining same in the beta? Um, what will be the upgradations in the beta? What are, what are our limitations with beta? Upgradations, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question. OK, that's complicated. Uh, Sorry. Okay, no problem, no problem. Yeah, so now, uh, you know, uh, Firefly have a tagline, like making space for everyone. And at Star, yeah. we also believe that space is for everyone. So can you please justify this, that how you, uh, you know, how are you making space for everyone? Um, our first payload is actually, we called it the dream payload. So we asked a couple of different contenders and they were able to launch something into space during, in our first payload. So we have like some school projects going in space, like from elementary schools to like college students stuff as well. So we're kind of just including everyone in our first payload, our first rocket launch. Um, for making space for everyone, it just really focuses on how we are including everything to grow as a human race. Like for our future generations, like we're inspiring kids. Like one of my biggest things is one of, 
my oldest nephew right now loves space. So he always goes through my phone and like looks for pictures of stuff that I have. And he's like, what's going on? He's six years old. So ever since he was two, he's been interested. Like he doesn't really know, but he asks the right questions and it's adorable. So it's like capturing the young generation and it goes up into like my grandfather, who's 92 this year. He's always looking for our news uh, in his newspaper. He still reads the newspaper. And he's always looking for my picture. And I always tell him I'm never in the picture because I'm at the test site. Um, so it's just kind of including the, the love of space and science through everyone and making it all happen together. Uh, my grandfather was in the Vietnam War, so he did radio communications. So now that I'm doing some instrumentation, he is really intrigued by it. It's really, really, it's really heartwarming and wholesome to I see guess. like he's very interested in it. And I sit down and, and I talk to him in both languages in Vietnamese and English to try and to describe to him how a rocket works. And it's actually very <laughs> difficult to do that. Yeah. Uh, and then I go from that and I go to like my six year old nephew who always asks me how it works. And he sees some of the pictures we have. And one of the ones on the website, I believe is uh, the stage separation. And he, when he was, I think four years old, he came up to me, he saw that he's like, auntie, why? why are we doing this? And I said, well, it's empty now and we don't want to carry the weight. So we have to drop it off. Hmm. He's like, it's going to fall on your house. I said, no, 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 <laughs> it's not going to fall on my house. He said, it's going to fall on my house. I'm like, no, no, sweetheart. It's not going to fall on your house either. It's going to fall on the ocean. And then he asked me, okay, if you do that, you're going to need a very big boat and a very big crane to take it out. I was like, yes, we do. We will have that. We will take care of that. <laughs> so, it's, it's like wholesome and genuine and heartwarming to see like young generations get into space and then older generations like seeing their younger generations <laughs> take over. And so it kind of makes it feel like it's for everyone. Like everyone can understand it. We, we discuss it in such a way that um, everyone can understand it and uh, be a part of what's going on. And we have a friends and family event before in which our family shows up and that's where my little nephew saw it for the first time and I told him he had to stay with his mom and he said no can I come with you and I said no you can't you can't sit in the control room with me but in my mind I almost wanted to say yes you can sit with me just be quiet and that was the, one of the times I've ever seen him quiet so it's making space for everyone is just grabbing the whole universe's ideas and kind of coming together for a common uh growth and share and being one instead of many different people and then we could launch stuff for like college students um projects that's always very cool and then to big company stuff as well so it's just capturing every bit of the human race together to yeah. bring it up to the space and that's like the final frontier yeah so actually there was a time where you know uh, space, like space products were only built by the scientists and engineers and the big laboratories. But now space has reached to the classrooms, like students are building satellites and they are being launched by the government and the private companies. So, yeah. you know, now that, that's how we can justify that space is now open for everyone. Like you can build stuff and you can experiment out things in space. And even I guess uh, European Space Agency and a lot of companies have their private satellites in space who uh, where students can sit and program and they can perform experimentation. So they don't need to build their own satellites and put a lot of money into that. They can just upload the software there and they can perform the experiments. So yeah, now because with the help of private companies, the space is now becoming easier than before. Yeah. We have a question like, uh, how many stages of testing do uh, you, you go through before uh, you know launching your rockets? How many what? stages of testing like how many or in the number you can also tell in the number yeah. okay so we test at component levels first so let's take example my first engine so my first engine came to me as uh basically a prototype and our thrust chamber first so we tested that one first as just pressure fed from the test stand and then we started bringing in components so we tested the main valves together and then we tested other little valves on the system and then we tested the turbo pump for it so i still have um fond memories of testing the turbo pump and then i remember the first time my boss came to me he said okay we're gonna put together the engine and i said excuse me we're doing what <laughs> he's like we're gonna put it all in one piece and we're gonna test the engine together and i said okay so panic happened and it was excitement 
So we did a lot of preparation for that. So let's think, I think for Thrush Chamber, we did, as a prototype, we did, I think, six months worth of testing. In the meantime, as we built up the real one, the real engine, the real first iteration. So the Thrush Chamber, once it completed, um, basically we were testing different injectors and styles to get the right components, O to F, combustion product, everything. We tried to, we tried to hone it in. And once we started getting closer to what we wanted, then we started building up that type, that style that we knew was going to work. So it kind of varies depending on time. But for Thrush Chamber, I think that took the longest time. I think it took about like eight, eight to 10 months, eight months throughout from like prototype to like the full and full, um, the, the latest iteration. And then Turtle Pump took, I think, four, four to five months. And then when we put it together, I, we did pretty well with that one. Um, so that was our lightning engine, which is stage two. We did, uh, we're still testing it. We we're trying to figure out different methods. And then, but in the meantime, we only have one functional engine testing right now. So we go between like stage one testing and stage two testing engines. So it's like back and forth a lot as like mm -hmm. one's building up this one and then we keep cycling around. So got pretty good at flipping the test stand around. Okay. So although I say like eight months, but in those eight months we're doing like turbo pump testing in between thrust chamber testing in the meantime of main valve testing. And then we're doing like stage one uh, thrust chamber testing too. So it's just, it's a long time, but it's like we have to build up in between and we have different components in between as well. So I think, and then for engine testing, Reaver's done, I think six, six to eight campaigns. Okay. And the light has done more. Uh, but we have the analysis team that kind of really helps with determining what is going to be ideal and then testing confirms or denies some of those. And it's just a lot of iteration between the teams, like design, analysis, design analysis, and then mm -hmm. it's like production and manufacturing and then build up integration and then testing and the testing mm -hmm. goes back to analysis and kind of just keeps feeding the system. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Fine. So uh, we have another question from Ankit. Like, uh, so if you uh, if you get a chance to go to Moon or Mars, which one will you choose and why? So I'll modify this question. I'll add one more thing, one more option option for you. Like, uh, if you get an, a chance to visit ISS and uh, safe uh, return trip back to Earth, second as an option, an option as uh, Moon again with a safety return, and Mars with no safety return, like one one side ticket. So which will you choose and why? Oh, I definitely yeah. think the moon. I would love okay. to go to the moon. <laughs> okay, cool. I think as like a little girl staring at the moon, uh, it was just phenomenal to see this piece of rock basically following us all the time. It was just astounding to me. ISS would be cool too. Yeah. Uh, I go moon, ISS, and Mars, but I have a family, so I'd like to come back. Why not Mars? Okay, okay. Because just because you have got one side ticket, okay. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> okay. I would like to come back. I'd like to share my experiences so that we could help teach the younger generation so that they could build the future technology. I feel like what we have okay. is good, but definitely as time progresses, I think it's also about our future generations carrying on our legacy and our technology as well. So I think it'd be more beneficial for them to learn from our experiences. Okay, cool. So what do you think? So uh, does Firefly have any, you know, vision for building products for Mars in future? I, I don't know. From okay. what I've learned and from what I've experienced and my, my insight on the company, I think we're very focused on like Leo and solar synchronous. And basically, we want to get to the moon. I don't think we see Mars just yet. Okay. I think a lot of cool. things is like focus on this initial alpha launch and then see how, where, where the doors open. And I don't think it's out of this question. I think we definitely could make it. I just don't think it's in our current plans yet. The moon is definitely in our plans, yeah. but Mars might be, as we grow, we'll probably see, we'll probably accept the challenge. No Firefly, we like to accept the challenges. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, uh, a question from my side is like for uh, star is into space education and we do a lot of students outreach programs uh, so i would like to know that uh, how important it is the space education is to grow a, a space startup ecosystem in a country like india where we actually don't have a so matured space startup ecosystem as of now 
but uh, since last five years it have scaled up but still it is not so mature at like in other countries so how important uh, the space education is to grow this ecosystem i think space education is very important because it's the final frontier is outside of our world like our what we're pulling we're getting pulled down to gravity with uh it's everything above us is what i think of a space like flying aviation that space you're moving against gravity basically so i think it's important to understand science and how the world all re reacts with each other and how ecosystems work and how every bit of the what we don't know out there is scary it's terrifying but it's also like we can learn so much and grow so much from this that we could be even come, we could even become stronger as a human race so yeah uh, so we have got one more question from ishant he is asking that uh, what are the parameters that we keep in our mind while selecting a launch site and i would like to know the launch site of firefly space uh right now we are determined to launch from vandenberg california so that's like southern california okay. uh we're building that up right now and i think when we get closer to launch i actually get to get sent out over there to help with the launch team so i'm like, super excited about that and i'm super <laughs> excited to learn about the rf environment as well so okay. maybe i'll get back to you guys on that one later uh, yeah. um, uh, so we're going to launch from vandenberg and then uh when we're taking a launch uh location it all depends on the environments that is available and what infrastructure is available. So we we considered many different places and I, we decided on Vandenberg first. Uh one thing that we always have to consider is the weather uh in the time of year you get to launch. So you have to consider like our seasons as well, the winds, the environments, the max the min uh everything you could see there so it's kind of like dependent on like how extravagant can the environment be if you do want like a high wind place you have to you have to use more uh thrust to like kind of fight that or do you want something that's like not as windy and you could just go mm -hmm. for it so you have to like really consider what is the environments that you are launching in the weather that day the winds the temperatures the basically a little bit of everything and then time of year it plays all into the effects of how we get to pick a launch location okay cool that's cool so we have got a question like what are your views on enhancing the payload delivery capability uh, with the help of electric propulsion system for example an adapter with electric propulsion can enhance launch vehicle payload carrying capacity so your views on that uh absolutely i think it's definitely part of the future uh our current systems are uh well developed so it's always good to try new things and develop new things and kind of test the limits and figure out what is actually efficient in the world so absolutely is yeah. electric propulsion is part of the future yeah that is uh okay so we have a question from deepak who was supposed to be the host for today's session but uh the table stand and so every time i sit in the audience and i keep on asking questions to the panelists but today i am hosting this for the very first time i'm super nervous and excited both <laughs> But yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> We're excited. excited. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Deepak is asking during the testing process on what devices do you rely upon for collection of the data? Uh, we use LabVIEW. I think I can share that. Um, okay. We use programs in which we built in house, and then we develop together. It's actually very interesting because as instrumentation, I use a lot of it. but i haven't learned how to modify anything yet so i've been learning how to modify the program a little bit and it's actually very exciting it feels to me like a black box at first yeah. as like a test engineer uh when i first started using it i had no idea what was going on uh and then like over time of course i learned i troubleshoot uh as testing happens things happen like one time we lost power and we lost power to the test stand while things were up and pressurized and that okay. was one of the scariest moments of my life Uh I remember I had a call and at that point after that I learned exactly how to function when things happen so I try to instill in my younger engineers like hey monitor the system pay attention to weather because we live in the middle or our test site's in the middle of uh kind of nowhere Texas it's north of Boston but it's a little bit empty so when the weather changes we see like strong winds coming and we lose power we had generators and everything uh so our generators kicked in just in time to save the test stand another time so we shut down but our generators kicked on real quick 
So we had just enough time to shut down the test stand. It was very stressful. So uh. <laughs> we have to pay attention to what's happening with our what environment. So sometimes we see uh, like a cold front come in. So the winds pick up a lot and like everything's just flying mm. around. So we have to monitor like where does our fluids go? How does that affect everything? So we just have to pay attention. Okay, cool. So I think this all things are going to help us out during our, you know, future projects on the liquid engines. Like we are planning to build the smaller version of the liquid engine uh, yep. for our future launch vehicles. Yeah. So we have got one more question, like uh, fortunate to have, I guess this is not a question. Ah, this is a question. Fortunate to have you, ma'am. How was your feeling at the very first time while you guys were watching the live static fire of your rocket engine by the way flame of that engine is quite awesome so i learned said this she was excited not ours yeah yeah <laughs> so first time seeing an engine is that the question yeah so uh, another uh, the other is not the question he is uh, he's oh. telling that the flame was quite awesome oh, okay yeah so the first time um being in testing, you see it from a different perspective a lot. You sitting, you're sitting behind a computer, you're watching the videos, so you can see it up close, but you never feel the power. So the first time I actually like sat outside and watched the engine was when we had our friends and family event, and I sat with my nephews and my now husband, and it was magical to see. That was my work. I did that for like months, and now I get to share it with my loved ones. And, like my mom was there behind me, and like my husband, and like my two little nephews, and they're just so excited like in awe and it's just heartwarming to feel like i hope these little boys and like my nieces too they all like this one day and hopefully my kids will like it one day in which you know it's astounded but it's but they all it's okay I'm not gonna push it um but yeah seeing it for the first time and like feeling the power feeling the heat on you like we're at a safe distance away we have a we measured all distances and everything to make sure like what is okay and so that was our like lo our second stage engine. So that's the single one. So our first stage engine is more powerful. Um, okay. So I think the first time I attempted to watch it, I actually ran from my trailer to the viewing area and it was a lot more powerful than I remembered because sitting inside a building, you don't feel it as much. So being outside and hearing it, seeing it directly, I remember yeah. my ears were ringing afterwards. I texted my coworkers and I said, I shouldn't have been out there. It's very loud. So I uh, like, make sure we don't set, we don't test at night. It scares everyone. So yeah. it's phenomenal to see the two different viewpoints as well. Like now my family got to see it on the outside. They want to see it on the inside now, like what I get to see. And I sit with me in the control room and I kind of see what I see. So I'm trying to arrange for that one soon too. <laughs> but that sound is like a melody to our ears. Like, because, and we are it actually, yeah, we are excited to listen to that sound in India as well now. Uh, oh, yeah. So we have another question from Deepak. Like He's asking, do you perform the initial test by using water as a propellant or do you go for the actual propellant test directly? We go for the real propellants. Okay. We do take steps, though. So we do in such manner of like, um, we use like, Mm, let's see we do functions of it first so we for like the first engine before we went to the big engine the full engine when we did it at, as components we learned it a lot during those spaces and then we started combining things together so we kind of we don't use we would use the real propellants but we do it in such a safe manner that we learn every time to build up and we are more confident as we step into the engines okay so we have a question from Uman, like he's asking, what's your company future prospects in the terms of propulsion system they are using right now? Um, I believe we have released our OTV or orbital transfer vehicle, and I believe that's electric propulsion. So I know we are moving towards electric as well. So as we grow and progress, we're going to launch with what we have, and we're going to make it more efficient. And then we also step into future technologies as well. Okay. So we're growing. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So another question is your experience on working with the Genesis lander. I have not worked on the Genesis lander, so I cannot ex share that information because I haven't touched it at all. I think they're still building it, so I haven't gotten the chance to receive anything for testing yet. Uh, okay, cool. 
So maybe after you perform the test in future, if you have, if you, if we get you on board back again, then we, you can surely. I hate keeping you guys up to date. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, another question from Vishant is: Do you use computer software for rocket simulations for engines? And if yes, what kind of software is? Yes, I guess they should be using this or any software. Yes. So our analysis team, uh, they perform all that information, so I'm not as familiar with it. I know for sure they do. There's a lot of simulations that develop and we use before we build anything. So the answer is yes, there are programs. I'm not 100% sure which ones are used. I think we're in the process of picking a good one as well. So I think there's like a handful in our company. So I'm not 100% sure, but absolutely yes, we do a lot of analysis beforehand. Our analysis team actually helps us during testing as well. We like, we uh, message them while we're testing and like, is this what you're expecting to see? Or something like yesterday, I installed a new sensor on the ground for heat flux sensor. And I had no idea what to expect. I didn't know what we we're gonna see. So like my analysis colleague was telling me like, hey, we're expecting to see this. So when we were running the test yesterday, I saw it rise to that level. I said, ooh, is this what you're expecting to see? Cause I'm seeing that too. <laughs> he was like, yes. So kind of like we work hand in hand to kind of figure out like, is this what we're expecting, what we're not expecting? So then if it's not what we're expecting, how do we figure out mm. what, what what happened? Yeah. yeah, so this is a very interesting question coming from Deepak, like this question I had in my mind as well. Like NASA have a superstition of having uh, peanut butter like during their missions, like uh, crucial times. So do you have any superstition while uh, you know performing any test? Actually, no. I've, I've seen a lot of things happen so okay there's no correlation sometimes and i always see something new happen so i can't find anything that's traditional okay the so only there's no pattern say, yeah something is always happening there's no trend there's to me it, it, you can't predict testing so every time i, yeah. I just meet him like well this is a new one like one of my sensors died i was like well that one's never died before that's new and that's it <laughs> I, yeah. we're trying to start a superstition to where we have good test days in Hawaiian shirts, but we haven't followed through with that one all the way through <laughs> yet. We ran out of shirts. Uh, okay. Like we at Star do have one, like uh, during a launch, we all wear black jersey. And uh, whenever we do that, we, uh, we, we always have a good launch. So yeah, uh, we'll take another question. Like uh, how does environmental factors like temperature and et cetera affect the testing of the launch vehicle? except the bad weather conditions? Uh, weather conditions affect the launch vehicle in case you have to use, you're expecting to launch vertically. And then if your winds are coming at you, you have, you're losing your mm. thrust that way. So you kind of have to pay attention to that. So like if it's super strong winds, you're not gonna, you're gonna be fighting more just to get back to, to correct your trajectory. Yeah. Okay, cool. So now we'll have two more questions and then we would end the session because we are running out of time. Uh, so like, uh, by what time prior to the liftoff should the launch director give a go or no go for the launch? Um, again, I haven't really looked at the launch stuff, so I'm not 100% sure, but I believe they, it's like an ongoing process. I believe like within a week, like do we see everything coming out properly as like a day-to-day -day thing as well? Like oh, how our systems are working, is everything running as expected? We have to do a lot of qualification testing beforehand as well. So okay. like uh, we test stuff beforehand at the test site as we're uh, sending it before we send it out to the launch site in which we perform our day-to-day -day functions and how we, pro we project test or launching would be. And then we have to provide that information for the range as well. And for the government and for everyone who needs to see it, we'll see it. So we have to like prove to them that we are capable of it. So I think it's kind of like a ongoing process of go or no go. I think the launch director has, I think within the 21st, 21st 24 hours or the 24 hours before launch, they get to the, a lot of word stays in there. I'm not 100% sure. Okay, and what about while performing a test? Like before how while many performing seconds a you test, can go? Up until yeah. the point, the, the director at that point would have control the entire time. So even if we are running the auto sequence and something's not working properly, the launch director, test okay. director, other directors could say we needed a board. So we have a manual board button to shut it down as well. 
Okay. So we have, we have a lot of control. They have a lot of control in that situation as well. So then if like okay. leading up to the situation, leading up to the testing, if something's not working properly, they have authority to say, we need to reevaluate the system. Okay, cool. So I guess we have answered almost all of the questions. We have covered all, all the questions which were asked by the audience. And now final question coming from my side, and that is uh, a piece of advice for the all aspiring space pioneers who want to, you know, that space. Uh, my biggest advice would be don't give up. For me, growing up as a child of immigrants, we, my parents didn't speak much English and i had no idea what was happening i was very lost and so we i didn't know what i was capable of i didn't know what i wanted to do i didn't know like although i love space and like it looks good now going back on it i was very uh i didn't know what i wanted to do we ran into a lot of situations in which we weren't very fortunate in my family um so during those times i just didn't give up on what I wanted to do and what I believed in. And I was truthful to who I wanted to be as well. Like I found out that, um, you know, you're as, as a kid, you're like, oh, you're gonna, you wanna do this, you're gonna go and do this. And it's, it's like a straightforward path. No one ever told you that it's gonna be a lot of circles, a lot of rotaries, a lot of wrong exits. Yeah. And you have to figure out like where you wanna go. And it's not just a straight shot. It's like, you go up a ramp, you went down the wrong ramp. Like you could go so many places to get there. So I always want to tell the aspiring students and generations that just don't give up. Like what you know in your heart to be true is what will become your reality. Like life gets hard, life is terrible. You could get rejected from schools, you could lose a parent, you could lose everything, you could move across the country, the stuff that has happened to me. And you know, what really pulls through is how you believe in yourself and how you push through and follow through with what you want in your life because ultimately you're living your life and you get to make it something worthwhile for you and your future generations and all that surrounds you. So just don't give up on your dreams because yeah. it's never going to leave you. You can always, you can always find new dreams. It doesn't have to be your childhood dream. You can find one now and follow through now. It doesn't have to be now. Like it doesn't have to be from your six year old life. You could be, 16, 26, 36, 60, and still find something new that you want to pursue. But you always have to follow your heart and be true to yourself and not give up on yourself. Yeah, that's really a great piece of advice from your side. So I read somewhere that, uh, you know, how you can get a good experience. So you get a good experience from good decisions and how you get yeah. good decisions from the bad experience and how you yeah. get bad experience from the bad decisions. So it all starts uh, with a bad decision and then ultimately you reach somewhere. And the only one thing that you need to take care of is you don't need to give up. So that's yeah. a really great piece of advice. Uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us and thank you audience for asking such wonderful questions. Even I learned a lot of things from you and uh, thank you once again. And we wish you all the best for your future missions. And we wish to see uh, your rockets, uh, you know, getting into space as soon as possible. Yeah. So thank you so much. So no, guys, uh, we will be coming up with uh, our sessions. Uh, uh, so now, uh, if, uh, like our upcoming sessions are with uh, George Salazar. He's from NASA. Then we have Ron Sparkman. He's the founder of Stardom. And then we have a cool speaker from um, uh, SpaceX and uh, Vector Launch. I won't reveal the name. So just stay tuned to our Facebook page. That is Startup Surat. And we'll see you guys. Thank you so much, Annie, for thank coming uh, and for uh, accepting our invitation and, and for inspiring us. Thank you so much. Thank you.